Step one is now complete. MSNBC. When the day is just about done, the world isn't going anywhere. It'll now be there waiting for you. The News with Brian Williams, every night at 9, only on MSNBC. Remember when your address was where you lived? Cell phones were only in prison. And a mouse on your desk was hard to handle. Today, life has a whole new meaning. Now there's a show that makes the digital revolution work for you. At home, at school, and at the office. The Site, on cable. On the internet, on MSNBC. The Site, every night at 10, on MSNBC. Imagine if you could turn back time. Good evening, I'm Tom Brokaw. I don't believe that I ought to quit. Maybe you're wondering how I got here. It was like being in the eye of a hurricane. Lift off. What can you say about a site like that? Relive your life and times. Good evening, live from the Berlin Wall. With exclusive moments from NBC News. Join Jane Pauley for Time and Again. Every night at 7 Eastern, only on MSNBC. The White House, home of the President of the United States. In the coming months, the American people will hear the issues and decide whether Bill Clinton will be back here for another four years this evening. A conversation with President Bill Clinton on Internet. Live from the Roosevelt Room at the White House, this is Internight. Here is Tom Brokaw. Good evening, and welcome to Internight. It's going to be a nightly primetime program here on MSNBC in which we talk to the ma major newsmakers of the day. And what better way to launch this program tonight than with our guest, our special guest, the President of the United States. <clears throat> he faces an election campaign that will determine his and this country's future. Mr. President, I was struck by the fact that we're here in the Roosevelt Room no one personifies the beginning of the 20th century better than Teddy Roosevelt. And as we come to the conclusion of the 20th century, we're not only on cable television, but we're on the cyber universe as well, on the Microsoft network. It's a remarkable time. I think Teddy Roosevelt would like this very much. Uh, this is a room that is named for Teddy and for Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt's Nobel Prize, which he won in 1905, is here in this room. We keep it here. And he really brought us into the modern age. And we're now going into a very different kind of world. And I think it would excite him very much to see it. We saw another demonstration of that different kind of world today when Boris Yeltsin stiffed the vice president of the United States, to put it in inelegant terms. He <laughs> stood him up. They had an appointment. Vice President told me earlier this evening he doesn't know whether Yeltsin's in good health or not, or, or whether he, in fact, is just fatigued. Does that make you a little nervous that we don't know the condition of his uh, physical uh, being? Well, we have we don't know, but we have no reason to believe that he uh, has a serious illness. We do not know. But I talked to him just a few days ago. We had a very good talk. He was very glad that the vice president was coming over. Um, Mr. Mamyedov, his deputy foreign minister, uh, was just here a couple of days ago, and I saw him. So in terms of the relations between the two of us, our two countries, we're doing fine. And I would urge us not to read too much into it. After all, he's just finished an exhausting campaign. You know how exhausting it is to run for president of the United States. And keep in mind, if you want to be president of Russia, you have to be willing to travel through 11 time zones. So he's been through a lot, and he may just be tired. But frankly, he has had some health problems in he the has. past. What happens to our intelligence in Russia that we can't find out what's going on with the president? Well, we normally have a pretty good idea. Uh, and as I said, I. We certainly have no reason to believe, as I am talking to you tonight, that there's something serious wrong, but we just don't know. We, we, you know, we can't know everything, and uh, uh, we can't know everything instantaneously. But I have no reason to believe that he uh, did anything but ask Al Gore if he could delay the meeting. And I don't consider it being stiff, since he, he knows what, Al's, uh, what his itinerary is in Russia. He's not being asked to stay late or anything to, uh, to see him. Would you be surprised if Boris Yeltsin does not finish his four-year term and that the reins of power are assumed by somebody like General Levin? 
I would. I think he'll be able to finish his term. And uh, I was very encouraged that he found a way to put this new team together that kept uh, Prime Minister Turner Bearden there, who's the real symbol, I think, of uh, stability and uh, progress, discipline. Uh, they're, they're a good team. And uh, Mr. Levitt seems to be finding his way into the team. So I, I think it's working out reasonably well so far. What makes you more nervous, Russia's fragile democracy or China's uncertain future? I don't know that I'm nervous about either one, but I think that Russia is clearly uh, now committed to a democratic future and one in which it is a, a responsible partner in world affairs. I think China is committed uh, uh, to a future of uh, continued economic progress. Uh, I think they're still uh, ambivalent about uh, democratic freedoms, but we seem to be developing a more constructive relationship with them. Uh, I've told a lot of people, I'd like to say it again on your show because I want our, you've got a lot of future-oriented people listening to this show. Uh, I think how Russia and China define their own greatness in the next 20 years will have a lot to do with how the 21st century comes out. And I want them both to define their greatness in terms of the positive achievements of their people, their, uh, their winning and peaceful cooperation on economic and cultural and athletic fields and their willingness to cooperate with us to fight our common enemies, terrorism and proliferation of dangerous weapons and uh, environmental destruction and, and the diseases sweeping the globe. We need great countries working together if we're going to make the 21st century what it ought to be. Let's switch from international politics in the future to domestic politics. We have some polls tonight, good news and bad news for you. The latest NBC News poll shows that you've expanded your lead as of the moment over Bob Dole, you're leading now by a factor of 54 to 30 percent. That's about a seven percent, a seven point gain for you in just the past three weeks. Here's the bad news. Uh, we did a poll three weeks ago. We asked the question whether the people believe that you were telling the truth on Whitewater. By a factor of 55 to 24 percent, they said no. In Mrs. Clinton, uh, it's even greater, 62 to 18 percent of the American people believe that she's not telling the truth. These are fundamental questions about personal character. Doesn't that bother you some that the American people believe that they're not getting the truth from It bothers me some, but I don't see how they could draw any conclusion other than that, since if you looked at the information that they've been given, I'm sure it's four, five, six to one negative. And uh, I think character is a legitimate issue, and I look forward to, uh, to having that uh, discussion. But I think uh, that you can demonstrate character most effectively by what you fight for and uh, for whom you fight. And I believe that the fact that I've uh, stood up for the American people through uh, the uh, things like fighting for the family leave law or the assault weapons ban or the Brady Bill or the V-chip for parents or trying to keep tobacco out of the hands of kids and a lot of other issues, those things will count for something and they demonstrate character too. But on the other matter, I just, uh, I would like to remind everybody that uh, this has gotten a lot of exhaustive attention, uh, perhaps more than it deserves, and uh, every reading of the evidence, as opposed to another round of questions, uh, fails to demonstrate uh, any wrongdoing by either one of us. And I believe that in the end that'll come out and come clear to the American people. I just think that uh, in the meanwhile, all we can do is go about our business. We've got to keep working for the American people and let them sort that out. I feel good about it. What do you say to each other in the privacy of the living quarters about these questions, however, at the end of the day? Because none of us, after all, is immune to that kind of judgment on the part of the people that we care a lot about. Well, I try to remind uh, Hillary that not to worry too much about it because every time she goes out and people see her and she relates to people, uh, they admire her, they like her, they respond to her, uh, just as they did around the world in this last trip. Uh, where world leaders always contact me after she's been to a country and say, thank you for sending her. She really represents your country well. She inspires our young people. And thank you for doing it. And I also remind her about the, the evidence being on her side. I mean, the, uh, it didn't get a lot of publicity, but there's only been one definitive report on this whole business, and that was the Resolution Tr Trust Corporation's report, uh, supervised by a, a staunchly Republican appointee of the previous administration, which said that there was no evidence of any wrongdoing, not even any basis for a civil action against uh, me or Hillary or her law firm, and that her billing records, which received so much publicity, actually confirmed her account. Now, that's a dispassionate view of the evidence. So I think the American people are fair-minded. They've heard a lot more negative than positive, so they have questions. But I think 
in the end they say, well, what do we know? And what has this man done? And what have they done? What have they fought for? Who have they stood with? And so I keep, I remind her uh, whenever this comes up, and it doesn't come up so often anymore, that we only have so many hours of the day, and every day we spend thinking about that, every minute we spend thinking about it is a minute we're not working on the job we were sent here to do. And so we just try to cooperate when questions are asked and keep working ahead when they're not. She's had to appear before a grand jury, and your very close friend Bruce Lindsay has been named an unindicted co-conspirator. He's down in Arkansas now in another trial. Does that ever lurk in the back of your mind that there may be more indictments that will arrive at the White House, maybe even for the first family after the election? Is that possibility? No, I mean, it's, it's a highly politicized operation, and I think it's obvious. That there's no precedent for it in the, that I know of ever. But even so, it's very hard to just make things up. And uh, I don't think anyone doubts that, for example, uh, uh, Mr. Lindsay, if, if there was any serious evidence he'd done anything wrong, that the, they would have moved against him. So uh, we'll just wait and see. But I, I still believe it's hard to make a lie, stick, call it the truth. I think in the end the American people will figure it out. And uh, I wake up and go to bed every night with that assurance, and I'm just going to keep working. Mr. President, we've got a lot of ground to cover here tonight, a lot of substantive issues. We've got phone calls. We've got questions from the Internet as well to get to. We'll be back with Internet in a moment. The revolution begins here. Because from now on, NBC News and Microsoft will revolutionize the way you get news. MSNBC. A 24-hour cable and internet news service. The future of news from the people you know. MSNBC. The world is an amazing place. Every day it changes. Problem is, until now, you haven't always been there to see it. A lot of people don't get to see the early news, and they think the late news is on too late. But with our primetime news hour on MSNBC, you can see all the day's stories on your schedule. You can even get into the news by getting on the Internet. When the day is just about done, the world isn't going anywhere. It'll now be there waiting for you. The News with Brian Williams, every night at 9, only on MSNBC. Mr. President, do you think that smoking is an American health hazard? Absolutely, I do. And addictive? Yes. In the last 10 years, the tobacco companies have given the Republicans something like $7 million in campaign contributions, but they've given your party $2 million. Why don't you make a pledge tonight to the American people you'll take no more tobacco money? Not just the Clinton campaign, but the Democratic National Committee. Well, I, I think the Democratic Committee is reviewing its policy, although let me say, I have, I have never... Uh, fought even with the Republicans over their money. It's just a question of does uh, does the money have an adverse impact on your policy? It's their policy I disagree with. Uh, I have never tried to even put the tobacco companies out of business. I think they have a right to sell a legal product and they have a right to market it to adults. The real problem is that it's illegal in every state in America for children to start smoking, but 3,000 start every day. A thousand of them will die sooner because of it. And we have to do something to stop it. And uh, you know, they'll have to answer whether the, the fact that they do better than we do on contributions has anything to do with their policy. But our policy is the correct one. And, you know, I don't want to treat the people who work for these tobacco companies like they're not citizens. They're, they're not doing anything illegal, but, the, but they're wrong in fighting us on this policy. They should help us. Now, but given all that, why not just turn off the money spigot? Well, the money spigot has been pretty well turned off. I think that the last couple of years they're going five, six to one for the Republicans. But Again, I, I don't want to get into that. I, the, the money is relevant only insofar as it has an influence on the wrong-headed policy. These people, they're not criminals because they work for tobacco companies. They have a, they're citizens. They have a right to participate in the political process. They have a right to have their voices heard. They have a right to sell legal products. What is wrong is they are marketing in ways that, that they know, I believe they know, has to be appealing to young people. If you look at young people, for example, who smoke illegally, are far more likely to buy the most heavily advertised brands than adults are. And uh, smoking would continue to deteriorate in this country and go down in, as a health hazard if 
people didn't start before they were adults. And I, that, I just want to keep the, the attention of the American people focused on that. And I, that's why I'm, my fight with the, with the Republicans has been clearly focused on their policy. They, got, they may get more money because of their policy, but their policy is wrong and they ought to change it. Recently, Bob Dole said, in response to criticisms of his stand on tobacco, you know, the Clinton administration, the use of marijuana and other illegal drugs went up before he started to do something about it. Why were you so laid off the mark and beginning to attack what was a plain increase in the use of illegal drugs during the last four years? Well, the, first of all, I don't think that's a fair criticism. I think the, uh, if you go back and look at our 93 budget, we asked for more funds in 93, both for enforcement and for treatment. Uh, I named a drug czar promptly, a man with a lot of experience running big city uh, police operations, dealing with drugs. And then when he left, I named General McCaffrey, who had uh, managed uh, our Southern Command and dealt a lot with drug exports. So I've been interested in this right along. The drug use did start going up in the early 90s uh, among young people, especially marijuana use. Cocaine use has continued to drop, but there's diversifying drug use. It's a terrible problem. We're working on it. We have a strategy. We're trying to implement it. And uh, we've basically been able to do this in a bipartisan fashion in this country in the last 10 years or so, and I'd like to see us continue to do that. But it is a serious problem. When I came here, we instituted, even in the federal government, in the executive branch, uh, stiffer drug testing uh, policies than the legislative branch had. I think it's a really serious problem. I have always fought it. We'll continue to do so. Let's talk for a moment about welfare. The Republicans have a bill that they think you will sign on the Hill. It eliminates the federal guarantee of cash assistance for poor children in this country, a guarantee that we've had in place since the early 1930s. Are you prepared to have that happen? Depends on what else is in the bill. But you would, you that would, is, if, if, if you can foresee the possibility that will take away the ultimate safety net of no federal cash assistance the, for very poor children. Of the guarantee. If, if the bill has provisions in it which provide more child care to these same families, uh, which have more flexibility to enhance the ability of these, the parents and these families to go to work, uh, which, which help the young uh, parents who have children at home to be better parents, uh, the money will still be spent on the children. The reason, they won't get a, the reason they want to get rid of the guarantee is so, so the states will have more flexibility to require people to move from welfare to work more quickly. Uh, and if that's what's going on, then I can support it if the rest of the supports are enough. Let me just make one other point. There is a dramatic difference already in the welfare benefits from the poorest to the richest states. There's not really a national guarantee that amounts to much now. We're not going to leave this alone. We're going to come back to Let's it in a moment it. because we want to talk some more about that. We want to hear from our viewers out there by telephone and the Internet. Back in a moment on Internet Night. on internet and we're looking with the President of the United States at uh, various chat rooms on the online service that MSNBC is providing to all of you. How, here's a question that came from one of the many thousands of people who submitted them. How will you keep the Social Security system solvent without raising taxes? That's on the minds of a lot of people, especially because your generation is a big bulge out there. That's right. And the question is, can Chelsea afford you as parents in about 10 years? I think that's the relevance of it all. The answer is there will probably have to be some changes uh, in the Social Security system. And what we need to do is to preserve its integrity in the same way we did in 1983. In 1983, we had a bipartisan commission. Uh, representing all the various interests in the country. They came up with a proposal and they implemented it. Now then they, they did raise the payroll tax, but if you look at it now, it's a long way. This, this system's solvent until 2019. And so we can make some changes now that won't require payroll tax changes that I believe will be widely accepted by the American people uh, if, we, if we get into it and we do it in a totally nonpartisan way the way we did in 83. There's a growing wave of people out there who believe that we ought to either privatize it or give people that option. Do you think that's a good idea? Well, I'm, there's a, uh, apparently going to be a report issued from the advisory commission that will recommend that this be looked into. Uh, I, think, uh, I think if you privatize the whole thing, you would really put people who are not sophisticated investors and didn't have a lot of money on their own at serious risk. If you gave them the option individually or as a system to do it, that's something I think you could study. You can even, that, that's something that could be tested. 
but before we do something that totally changes something that's worked rather well, there ought to be a way to test it uh, in a kind of a laboratory sense. And I would favor looking at it very closely with some evidence before we made a, a big sweeping decision. Here's another question. Uh, we had 60,000 hits on this system and 8,000 questions submitted. What is the most important thing that you've learned in the last four years? That the president can really make a positive difference but that it requires every bit of concentration uh, every day to do it. You simply cannot be distracted. Uh, you have to keep thinking about your job and the American people. That's the most important thing. That, that I feel more optimistic today than the day I became president about the potential of all of us to change our lives together for the better, especially the presidency, but it requires enormous discipline not to be distracted and not to be diverted. And, and I think there are a lot of other things I've learned. I've learned more humility. There are a lot of things I don't know the answers to that I once thought would be easy to find out. Were you ready for prime time when you arrived here, do you think? I think I knew enough to be president. Uh, I think I, uh, and I think my ideas were right and my vision was right. Uh, I think I would have been uh, probably a little more successful early on if I'd had more Washington experience. But I think maybe the fact that I didn't have any made me... Uh, more optimistic about what I could get done and more ambitious, and that, that was good. But I think that, that I'm definitely better at my job than I was four years ago in terms of just getting through the day-to-day -day work of it. I just learned a lot. I don't, think any, I don't think anyone, even someone who's been around here a long time, can be fully prepared for the pressures and the work of the presidency until you actually do the job. Here's another question, Mr. President. It's very relevant, very timely. With U.S. soldiers dying in defense of Saudi oil fields, shouldn't we have a renewed vigor about the pursuit of freeing the United States from the dependency on foreign oil. There's not been much talk recently, fairly, from either party about conservation or finding alternative forms of energy. Well, to, we have had, that's one of our budget fights that we had with the Republicans. Um, let, let me say, let me answer that question in two parts. We are not in Saudi Arabia uh, simply for Saudi oil fields. We're there because uh, it's a base from which we can prevent further aggression by Saddam Hussein in the area. First and second, it's a base which enables us to cooperate with those who agree with us in the Middle East, including many Arab countries, in fighting terrorism. So that's not the only reason we're there. But we should be trying to become less energy independent. Uh, we have worked with Detroit to fund a clean car that gets three or four times the average mileage now. Uh, we have worked hard on alternative technologies. We have uh, worked hard to... Uh, to do things that would make us much more energy efficient. And frankly, uh, th this Congress disagrees with us on that. They don't believe we should be investing money in, in new technologies to achieve energy efficiency. But if you look at the explosion of technology that we're celebrating tonight, that same technology is available to make us more energy efficient. And we ought to be investing a lot more money in it because it's a way of cleaning the environment, reducing our dependence on foreign oil, and making us wealthier without really eroding the, the, the country and the, and the globe that we share. Why are the Saudis giving, giving us such a bad time on the investigation? And we've had to send the FBI Director Louis Free back over there for a second time to try to get things moving again. Why can't you get on the phone to King Claude and say, hey, well, we've had We've had uh, several uh, talks about it, and we expect that they will cooperate. Uh, and I think, the, uh, I, I think there will be cooperation. I do expect it. Uh, I believe, you know, any time a, a crime is committed in a country that's high profile, that nation wants to believe that it can handle it and do what's right. And uh, I understand that, but this is a case with international ramifications and we have to cooperate. Here's another question from the internet. Why don't we have a flat tax for everyone instead of taxing our income and then taxing everything we buy? It was a very popular issue, as you know, during the primaries. It was. Well, first of all, you should know that as far as the federal income tax, we're getting pretty close to a flat tax. 57% of the taxpayers uh, over the last couple of years have, have filled out that simple little form and paid the 15% with, uh, with the standard deduction. That's pretty close to a flat tax. But I have never seen a single tax rate that did not either raise taxes on everybody that was making less than $100,000 a year or leave us with a much bigger deficit. So I, am, I, I would do anything I can to further simplify the tax system. We're trying to let more people file electronically. I'm, I'm all for making the form simpler and the rate structure simpler. But I have never seen a plan, I've studied them carefully because I've, oh, I know how much people want to be free of it, doesn't either raise taxes on most people or balloon the deficit. We can't afford to do either one. Mr. President, we've got a lot more ground to cover tonight. We do have some telephone calls coming in as well as questions from the Internet. We'll be back on Internight in a moment. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. it is.
We're back on Internet, Mr. President. You and I have been looking at another question from <laughs> the question. Internet. Does Chelsea net surf, and if so, how do you protect her from inappropriate material? Does she use the computer for the handling? She does. Uh, I don't think she net surfs a lot simply because, at least during the school year, she has too much homework at night, several hours every night, but she does some. And I, honestly, I can't protect her in that sense because she knows so much more about it than I do. But one of the things that we're trying to do, I think with the support of everyone, is, is first of all, get a case up to the Supreme Court so that they can define what the First Amendment requires us to do and not to do in terms of legislation here. And then we need to find some sort of technological fix. Uh, during the break, you said that Mr. Gates, uh, Bill Gates said that there's at least a possibility of developing a log. So well, they've parents, got a log built in now yeah. that you can go so in and check, So parents can right? see what's been ca called up. And, of course, we're working on this V-chip with televisions and with the entertainment industry supporting us with a rating system. So there, there probably will be some sort of technological responses here. But then parents like me are going to have to assume the responsibility of becoming literate enough with the technology to work with our children to make sure that we... Uh, we and they make responsible choices. Mr. President, we promised a lot of viewers out there that they could ask questions via telephone. I think we can do that right now. We have a call from Great. from Leesburg, Virginia. A question for the President, please. President, uh, I'd like to know if the um, deductible that you're pro you have proposed for families, uh, the $1,500 for the college students, yes. uh, do you expect that that will come to fruition before the end of the year? And also, I would like to tell you and the First Lady, I think you're doing a wonderful job. Thank you. Uh, the truth is, uh, I don't know whether it will come to fruition before the first of the year. Uh, I think there's a chance we could pass it if I could reach agreement with the Congress on a balanced budget. Now, most of the experts here in town would tell you that's not going to happen because we're only three and a half months away from an election. But I still think there is a possibility that we can reach a balanced budget agreement. If it does, I will push very hard for my two major education proposals. One is a $10,000 deduction for the cost of tuition after high school for people without regard to their age. And in addition to that, a $1,500 credit for two years of college after high school, which would in effect guarantee uh, community college uh, access to people throughout the country. My goal here is to make college affordable for everyone, but to make the second two years at least a community college education as universal within a couple of years as high school is now, because we know we need that. I mean, look at what we're celebrating here tonight. We need more education. So I expect to push it, and if we don't get it this year and, uh, and I'm successful in the election, then it'll be a top priority just as soon as the Congress comes in next year. Mr. President, some people believe that for the moment it's just mostly campaign rhetoric, however, because you have not sent anything up to the Hill yet on the college deduction. But that's because if the only way we can pass it now, this year, is if it is put into an omnibus budget agreement. And so that's how I will advance it. And I'm still hoping we can do that. You know, we, we got agreement here. Look, we passed the anti-terrorism bill this year. We passed telecommunications legislation this year. Uh, we may get welfare reform. Uh, we may get the minimum wage. It's looking very good on the minimum wage. Uh, we might get the Kassebaum County health care reform bill. If we do all that, I don't see why we couldn't have a budget agreement, too. Mr. President, before we get back to the uh, Internet questions, I wanted to follow up just for a moment on welfare, if I can. If, in fact, you sign the Republican bill that's likely to come down from the Hill, all the projections show that that will push, at least short term, more than a million youngsters in this country below the poverty line. That's a high risk for youngsters in this country who are already in peril. That's right. There are two problems, though. The, the main reasons for that are the proposal on food stamps, which I think may be moderated some, and what I consider to be excessive cuts in assistance to legal immigrants. We're not talking about illegal immigrants. So before our budget negotiations broke up, I asked the Speaker and uh, then Senator Dole, and that would be Senator Lott, of course, to consider whether or not we ought to give uh, assistance to the children of legal immigrants, at least who were in trouble through no fault of their own. Their parents had an accident or got cancer or were mugged in a 7-Eleven or something. Uh, th those kind of folks, it seems to me, we ought to take care of the children. Now, if we did that, then I believe you'd see a continued reduction in poverty. Keep in mind, we let the states experiment with moving people from welfare to work. I've granted uh, 67 experiments to 40 states. So 75% of the people on welfare today are already under welfare-to-work programs, which have helped to reduce the welfare rolls by 1.3 million. Those kids are better off, not worse off, when their folks get off welfare. So that's what I want to do for the whole country. 
you know, in 1992, you said we're going to end welfare as we now know it, as we've been practicing it in this country. But most of your welfare proposals have been reacting to what the Republicans have proposed in the last year or so. They've not been. That's not accurate. I started granting these waivers. See, I helped to write the last welfare reform law, so I knew the president could tell the, could give states permission to try their own experiments. I started doing this in 1993. And then I sent legislation to Congress, which was not adopted in 94, so I just kept on doing the waivers. Then I vetoed the Republican welfare bill, and I kept on doing the waivers. So now, three out of four people in America are already on welfare, on the welfare to work experience. I think you can make a compelling case, as the New York Times said, that we've made a quiet revolution in welfare. I'd like to finish it. I'd like to go on and pass welfare reform legislation, but we're clearly moving in the right direction. We have another question from the Internet about, uh, in fact, foreign policy. And we're going to click on to it right now, even as you watch. We'll see how facile our people are. They're pretty good. Between the United States and China, what is more important, economy, the economy, or democracy? That's especially of uh, concern to people in Hong Kong, obviously, yes. because next year the Chinese take over that city. Well, I believe over the long run, between the United States and China, the thing that's most important is democracy, because I think the freer the people are, the more likely they'll be to be responsible partners. But the implication of that for, is... Uh, therefore, we should subordinate our economic goals or we should uh, withhold most favored nation status from them and not treat them like ordinary trading partners if they're not as democratic as we think they should be. That's what I disagree with. That is, imposing some sort of economic sanctions will not make China more democratic. I believe they're more likely to become democratic if they progress economically, if we have regular relationships with them, and if we don't pull any punches when we disagree with them, if they violate human rights or do other things we don't agree with. So I believe that economic development and democracy will go hand in hand. And if you, there's some evidence of that. If you look at South Korea, it's more democratic today than it used to be. It was led by economic advances. If you look at Taiwan, they just had a very raucous election there with a huge turnout, uh, growing out of incredible economic progress in the years before. So my hope is that we can find a way to deal with the Chinese and be partners with them and agree to disagree, but, but be honest about that so that we can follow economic and democratic objectives hand in hand. I think that's the way to pursue it. We have a question. I want to remind everybody that uh, we do have a telephone number out there. one 676 2287 That translates, you'll not be surprised to hear, into MSNBC USA after the 888 number. We have a call now from Miami, Florida, Mr. President. Your Hello, question. Mr. President. It's an honor to be speaking with you. As Mr. Brokaw said, I'm calling you from Miami. And we have, we are a community of immigrants, and there's two questions regarding uh, this community of immigrants that I'd like to ask. It's a two-pronged question, so please indulge me. If the first one has to do with our brief, Cuban please. community. Yeah. And we'd like to know whether you are going to enforce ti the title in the Helms-Burton bill, which allows Cuban Americans to sue companies and the investors in Cuba with confiscated properties. And the other question that I'd like to ask you is about the Nicaraguan community. As you know, there's a lot of Nicaraguans here in Miami, Florida, which have been here for a great deal of time. Many have been here for over 15 years. And there's a, a limbo as far as their immigration status goes. Many of them are in great danger because of the Simpson-Smith bill, which is about is pending in Congress. I'd like to know whether you are leaning towards signing the Sim Simpson-Smith bill and whether any decision at all will come regarding the status of the Nicaraguans. And I'd, I'd really encourage you to do so, to make a positive decision. They're a community which has contributed enormously let, to this let, community. Let's, let's, let's let, let me answer, answer the, the question. Nicaraguan right. question first. Uh, on the, the bill to strengthen our hand in dealing with illegal immigration, uh, I am strongly inclined to sign if we can get the provision out of there which would require uh, schools all over America to kick the children of undocumented uh, immigrants out of this country, out of the schools. I think that would be a mistake. Every law enforcement group in America has come out against kicking the immigrant children out of the schools. So we need a bill that would give us some more tools to deal with the problem of illegal immigration. It's, it's, it's out of hand and it's wrong. And it's costing the taxpayers too much money and it, it's, it's unfair to the legal immigrants who wait in line and do what they're supposed to do. Now, the Nicaraguans present uh, some special uh, issues, as you pointed out, and we will attempt to resolve those in a fair and honorable way. But on balance, the country needs this illegal immigration bill. With regard to the Helms-Burton bill, let me say, first of all, I signed it, as you know, after uh, 
the Cuban government shot down two airplanes and killed American citizens who were in international waters. Uh, we have already begun to enforce vigorously Title IV of the Act, which revokes the travel privileges to this country from companies that are involved in dealing with confiscated property. Uh, I have to make a decision on Title III tomorrow. After this program is over, I'm going to have a meeting about it, and then I'm going to have another meeting tomorrow. And I will uh, make a decision. I have, as I understand it, three or four different options under the law. Uh, the criteria is that I must do what I think is in the national interest of the United States and what is most likely to bring democracy to Cuba. And uh, in general, we believe that putting more pressure on does that. Uh, as you know, we've been uh, severely criticized by our European allies and others for, for doing this, and I was for signing the bill, but I believe that we have to keep pushing until we get a democratic response in some changes in Cuba. But I've not made a decision on specifically what I'm going to do on Title III, and I can until I have uh, these meetings tonight and tomorrow. I'll make a decision tomorrow. Mr. President, we have another question from the Internet on Internight. There it is. What do you admire most about Bob Dole, the man you're likely going to be running against next fall? Uh, well, I've, there are more than one thing I admire about him, but I think the thing I admire most about him is I believe he really loves our country. Uh, he, he was hurt very badly in World War II. He could have been embittered. He could have walked away. He could have uh, lived a very different secluded life. He threw himself into politics and public life. And on uh, several occasions, uh, when I had to do unpopular things, uh, even when he disagreed with me, he didn't try to stop me. Uh, when I tried to uh, help Mexico uh, because I thought it was important, it was unpopular, he agreed with me. When I tried to uh, support uh, democracy in Haiti, he disagreed with me. When I went into Bosnia, he disagreed with me, but he didn't try to interrupt it because he believed that you could only have one president at a time. And I believe he really loves America. And I think that's the first and most important thing for anybody who wants to get into public life. And, and I admire it. I think it's genuine, and I admire it. What do you think about the issues that your old friend Richard Lamb is raising, the former governor of Colorado, and the manner in which he is raising them? Well, I haven't, uh, I don't know about the manner in which he's raising them. I haven't had much time to keep up with the manner in which he's raising them. But I've known him a long time, and very well. And uh, uh, many of these issues we've discussed probably for 10 years or more now. And uh, he's, a, he's a brilliant man, and uh, he, he's a, a man with some very strong convictions, and he looks at the world in a unique way. And uh, I'm looking forward to whatever contribution he makes to this debate. Will Mrs. Clinton have a role at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago? Do you expect that she'll address the delegates? I don't know. You know, she didn't, I don't believe she spoke in 92. Uh, there was a campaign film in which she spoke, but I don't believe she did. And we really <laughs> haven't made a lot of the final decisions yet. It's her hometown, and she's looking forward to kind of hosting a lot of things uh, there in Chicago because uh, she always uh, has considered her home, and she still has a lot of uh, friends there from her childhood, and a lot of them are very active in the convention. So she'll be very active there, but uh, we, we haven't decided uh, what specifically she'll do. Here's a question from the Internet, one more. Independence Day, the movie. Could we really fight these guys off or what, Mr. President? I loved it. I loved it. And the... Uh, I, I met, a lot of people did, apparently. Mr. Pullman came and uh, showed it. I thought he made a good president, and we watched the movie together, and I told him after it was over he was a good president, and I was glad we won. And uh, it made me wonder if I should take flying lessons. But, yeah, I think we'd fight them off. We'd find a way to win. That's what America does. We'd find a way to win if it happened. The good thing about Independence Day is, uh, is uh, there's an ultimate lesson for that for the problems right here on Earth. We, we whipped uh, that problem by working together with all these countries, and all of a sudden the differences we had with them seemed so small once we realized there were threats that went beyond our borders. And I wish that we could think about that when we deal with terrorism and when we deal with the uh, weapons proliferation, we deal with all these other problems. That's the lesson I wish people would take away from Independence Day. Mr. President, we thank you very much for being our first guest here on Internight, the new uh, enterprise of MSNBC, which combines cable television, of course, and the Internet and telephones and over-the-air broadcasting as well. We thank you very much. We wish you well and Bob Dole as well in thank the coming you. months. Thank our, you very much. Our best to your family. We'll be back with more on Internet right after this. Step one is now complete. MSNBC.
We're back on Internet. The president has left us, but he's given us permission to use our room, the people's room. This is the Roosevelt Room at the White House. We're going to talk about the president's appearance here tonight and about American politics in general. That will be the topic of the discussion for the coming weeks as I do this program on MSNBC. Let's go to Little Rock now and one of our principal political correspondents, Gwen Eiffel, who is down there in the middle of all of the intrigue. The president's good friend, Bruce Lindsay, an unindicted co-conspirator, was down there for the legal proceedings today. The president seems to think that they'll rise above all that. Is that feeling in Little Rock, Gwen? Well, you know, everybody is waiting to see if Bruce Lindsay's ex uh, explanation for his behavior in the 1990 gubernatorial campaign when he was Clinton's treasurer washes. So far, it's going to have to it's going to have to do. He hasn't been indicted, as the president pointed out. He hasn't been charged. And what he's willing to do is go and say he did nothing wrong. And, and that might work here. Uh, Lisa Myers on Capitol Hill, you keep track of Bob Dole pretty carefully. I think tonight's performance by the president is one more demonstration of how formidable he'll be as an opponent for Mr. Dole come the fall. And it's uh, one of uh, Senator Dole's greatest weaknesses. I think it's one of the reasons that he's had such a terrible two or three weeks. Uh, he's having trouble deciding what his message is and getting that message out. Let's talk specifically about some issues that are likely to come up in the next 10 days or so. The president talked about that welfare reform bill that he is eager to get signed, obviously, before Election Day. Do you think that the Republicans are going to send one down here that will be, A, acceptable to him and to his Democratic allies on Capitol Hill, Lisa? Well, I think they may send one that is acceptable to him. It may not be acceptable to some of his Democratic allies. Frankly, I think there's more of an eagerness on the part of the president to sign a welfare reform bill than there is uh, an eagerness among Democrats on Capitol Hill. You made a critical point during the interview about this bill really undoing the guarantee of cash assistance to every poor child in America. That is something like, that Democrats like Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan of New York uh, think is a grave mistake. Tim Russert is now just outside, I believe, the West Wing of the White House. Uh, he is our Washington Bureau Chief Moderator of Meet the Press, of course. Tim, your call on the president and welfare. If, if he does sign the bill the Republicans send down, it probably will do him a good deal of good politically in the country, but how much trouble will it cause him in the Democratic Party, and is that of any consequence? It will hurt him, obviously, with some members of the Democratic Party, particularly in the Black Caucus and some of the liberal members in the Senate, Tom. But the political calculation is simple. In swing states like Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, New Jersey, welfare reform is extremely popular. Governors who are in office won on that issue. In the final days of the primary season, Governor Clinton, then Governor Clinton, relied on welfare reform commercials. I have little doubt that President Clinton will sign a welfare bill. He'll take some criticism from members of his own party, but the calculation is they have nowhere else to go but to stay loyal to President Clinton. And come the fall, will this president be running on his own, or will he be out in front enough to say, listen, I can come into your congressional district and help you. Maybe we can win back the Senate and the House. Tom, if these numbers hold that we saw today in the poll, you show the president 54 to 30, even if the race tightens a little bit, you're going to see Democratic congressional candidates flock to the president. They know full well there are such things as presidential coattails. A matter of three or four percentage points in swing districts can tip the scales. And, Tom, the Republicans know that. That's why Speaker Gingrich is demanding, pleading with Senator Dole to remain competitive in California. If the Republicans don't stay competitive in California at the presidential level, they could lose the California delegation, Republican seats in that delegation, and that could tip the scales and give the balance back to the Democrats. Uh, Tim Russia, you stay right there. Lisa Myers, you're in our office tonight. And Gwen Eiffel, you're in Little Rock. If you'll stay where you are, we'll be back on Internight in a moment. Imagine the freedom of instant access to the news you want when you want it. Now it's reality. MSNBC on the Internet. Not a service that duplicates, but innovates. In-depth coverage of the news you care about. MSNBC, bringing you the world on your desk, in your home, wherever you may be. When you want to know more, point it here. Dateline Tuesday. On the streets, crooks are making big bucks smuggling tax-free cigarettes. It's really not a whole lot different than a drug dealer. While your tax dollars are going up in smoke, could a major tobacco company be benefiting from this black market business? The volume of being moved is staggering. A Dateline investigation. Dateline Tuesday. 
We're back on Internight. The question to our political reporters here in Washington and in Little Rock tonight, beginning with you, Tim Russert. Does Bob Dole's choice of a vice presidential candidate change the equation for him dramatically come August? Uh, significantly, but probably not dramatically. He needs someone, I believe, Tom, who is young, vibrant, who shows a contrast in age, and someone the American people feel comfortable with. Uh, but it means, at best, three or four percentage points. Lisa, what, what's your judgment on that call? I think he needs to take a risk and do something exciting, something that will capture the imagination of the American people and get them to give him another look. Who's your name? Whitman or Ridge. Governor Christine Todd R R uh, Whitman or uh, Governor Tom Ridge of Pennsylvania. Okay, Gwen Ifill in Little Rock, it's time to put yourself on the line. <laughs> Well, I think that Bob Dole is going to have to come up with a message of his own, or it won't matter who his running mate is by the time he gets to the convention. He's got to come up with someone exciting. Governor Tom Ridge is an example. I am the one from the outside who thinks George W. Bush of Texas might be a good idea, but it's got to be something bold. What's the greatest possibility of peril for President Clinton between now and Labor Day, Gwen? Right here in, in, White, in Little Rock, <laughs> the Whitewater questions and what happens in that courthouse behind me. Any thought down there that there could be additional indictments for the White House? They actually hate the story down here. They really think that the, that the special prosecutor is just out to sink Arkansas. So nobody thinks it's going to have any legs here. All right. Thanks very much. Gwen Eiffel in Little Rock tonight. Lisa Myers at our Washington Bureau and Tim Russert just outside the White House. Thank you very much. I'll be back with a final thought on Internight in a moment. Thank you very much for joining us on this debut performance of Internight with the President of the United States. Remember, 8 Eastern Time, every night of the week, Bob Costas, Katie Kirk, Bryant Gumbel, and Bill Moyers, and I'm Tom Brokaw, will be here every night. Tonight, we'll remind you as well that Donald Baer, who's the Communications Director of the White House, and the Telecommunications Advisor, Greg Simon, will be on msnbc.com. We'll see you tomorrow night here on Internight. Senator Dole was invited to be here tomorrow night. We do expect to see him in the foreseeable future. Good night. You're connected to MSNBC.